Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. This is Alan Schimmel of DevOps.com. We're going to be starting our webinar today with uh, thought leader and author Gary Groover. In just another minute or so, we're going to allow late arriving guests to log on as, as we see many people are logging on as we speak. Until we do get started, though, for those of you already on, um, let me just quickly go over uh, our GoToWebinar control panel that most of you are probably seeing in the right-hand corner of your screen. We do use Citrix GoToWebinar, and it offers a number of ways for you, the audience, to interact with our speakers. Um, the first thing I'd like to point out to you is the question section of the webinar. And, you know, we have set aside time for uh, questions at the end of today's presentation. And you don't have to wait till the end to ask your question, though. You can ask, you can type in your question in real time as it occurs to you, and we will try to answer all, all of the questions at the end of the presentation. We already have someone who just came in and said hello, for instance, and um, hello right back at you and, and you can answer your questions there. Additionally, there is a chat section at the bottom of the uh, interface and you can chat there with the entire audience or, or speakers or what have you and your messages will show up there. We do encourage you, however, to use the question section for your questions. We'll also have a polling question or two today which you'll see pop up on screen and uh, that'll come at the appropriate time. Um, you, today's webinar will be featuring uh, our speaker, Gary Groover, on video, as well as his slide presentation. And um, I know many of you ask, will this be recorded and available later? And yes, it will be. We are recording the full presentation, including video, and it will be available within 24 to 48 hours on DevOps.com along with, hopefully, if we, depending how many questions we get, along with uh, any questions that we receive from the audience. So, with that being said, we are oh, just a few minutes here after the hour, but we do have many people actually still signing on as we speak. But that being said, Gary has a nice presentation uh, laid out for us, so let's get started. For those just joining, Hi, this is Alan Schimmel, Editor-in-Chief of DevOps.com. We're very lucky to have a very special webinar this morning or afternoon featuring well-known uh, DevOps thought leader and leader in general and well-known author, Gary Groover. Gary, welcome to DevOps.com. Thanks, Alan. Appreciate it. Okay. Gary will be talking today. Uh, around many things, but primarily around his new book, which has recently come out. It's actually Gary's co-author with Tommy Mauser, and the book is Leading the Transformation, Applying Agile and DevOps Principles at Scale. And it really represents, I, I've read the book and I highly, highly recommend it, it represents Gary's sort of best practices recommendations based upon his groundbreaking work at both HP and uh, Macy's. But you didn't come here to listen to me. Let me turn it over to Gary. And Gary, take it away. Thanks. If you could improve the productivity or software development by 2 to 3x, would it matter? If you could start saying yes to all the business requests that you created elaborate processes for saying no to, would it make a difference? What if you decided this was all too hard it was too compli complicated, wouldn't work in your environment, wouldn't work for your company, but your competitors decided to go all in and invest in transforming the way they do software development. Can you see how that'd make a difference for your company, your coworkers, and eventually yourself? 2 to 3x is a pretty bold claim, so I'm going to start off by sharing a story of a transformation I led at HP that easily deliver 2 to 3x improvements in productivity. I'll spend a little bit more time discussing how a lot of large organizations struggle with transforming their organization and why. And then I'll provide a framework for how to lead and transform a large organ enterprise organization 
and then I'll walk through kind of the different parts of the process you involve and share lessons from the journey and I'll follow that up with questions and answers at the end. In 2007, I had an opportunity to take over leading the LaserJet firmware organization. It was probably 800 developers worldwide, spending about $100 million a year, 10 million lines of code, supporting you know, 10, 20 different products that had been the bottleneck for the LaserJet business for over two decades. The organization was not able to put a new printer on its plans or to add a new firmware feature without checking with the firmware organization. And all too, answer the, all too often the answer was no, but because of capacity, we couldn't get this done. And HP is a pretty large company and had gone around the world trying to hire as many developers as they could to spin the way out of the problem, but it, it really wasn't working. I had an opportunity of sitting on the outside of this organization for many years, frustrated trying to release products, trying to get them competitive in the marketplace. And when I had an opportunity to lead this team, I felt like there had to be something different that we could do to become much more effective. And then 2008 hit, and we decided we were going to split between two architectures, land on the new architecture, and that I needed to be able to reduce my R&D cost by about half in the next 30 days. And so we had to dramatically reduce the cost, the number of people working on this, but we had the same pressures from the business to be successful and get it out there. And the LaserJet business is based in Boise, Idaho, and there aren't a lot of other jobs in Boise, Idaho. And because of that, there aren't, it's not easy to move from one job to another. So there were a lot of people in the community that were very dependent on the LaserJet business being successful and this new architecture getting redone and out the door. So I was really focused on any and everything I could do to be making software development more productive. I was thinking about day to day, day, to day night to night, trying to figure out how we could effectively get this new architecture out, get it done, and make it available and no longer have firmware be the bottleneck for our business. And we went along this journey of trying to set objectives month by month and trying to get better and looking back at what we did and what we didn't do, what was working, what wasn't working. And we went along this path and for the first several months, I didn't know I was doing Agile, I just thought I was doing common sense because we were constantly trying to get better and learn and do what we were doing and work through it. And month by month we went along and we got about 30 months into it and we finally looked back and realized that we had completely um, transformed our business to where firmware was no longer the bottleneck for the business. Our development costs had been reduced by about half. The number of products that we were supporting had gone up by 140 percent which remember this had been a big constraint for the business for years and then the number of the capacity that we were delivering to new features versus just porting current code from product to product went from 5 percent to 40 percent which has become more important because laser printers have gotten to the point where it was harder to differentiate on speed because you don't need a 200 ppm device on your desktop and the print resolution was harder and harder to compete on because we've met the needs of the customer in that space. And so we're trying to do more things like digital sending, um, security going on to the internet from a scanner and those types of things. And it was more and more important to differentiate with firmware and make that piece happen. It fundamentally was a huge breakthrough for the business, which really motivated me to share the learnings that basically I'd gotten from the organization in this first book, A Practical Approach to Large-Scale Agile Development, which is really a, a case study of what happened at HP. The other thing that was really interesting as I started getting more involved in the Agile community and the DevOps community is that I realized we didn't do a traditional Agile transformation where we focused on the team level and bring that up. In fact, we got two to three X improvements in productivity but when we looked at the team, we gave the teams a lot of flexibility in terms of how they chose to operate and how they tended to approach it. And what we found at the end of three years is some teams that adopted all the Agile principles, they were doing stand-ups, they were doing scrums, they were doing burn-down charts, they are working their stories at that level. And what we found is that they were making that work very well. We found other teams that were working in more traditional manners 
And what we realized is between the two teams, we didn't see a dramatic difference in productivity based on how they were doing it. But we did see a two to three X improvement overall across the organization. And this led to our conclusion that the first order effect in a large organization is not how the individual's teams work, but how teams come together and deliver value to the customer. And I think that's important because a lot of times you'll hear people talking about how to do DevOps and comparing it to unicorns and saying we just need to enable the teams to go off on their own and deliver the content. But I think what people lose track of is in most large traditional organizations, you have a tightly coupled architecture that requires groups of teams to work together because on their own, because the architecture is so tightly coupled, they can't develop, qualify, and deploy code independently. So ideally, you'd go to a microservices type environment that would enable small, nimble teams to just be testing and evaluating with their customers. But the reality I see for most large enterprise organizations is it's too tightly coupled to get there. The other thing is, as you do a transformation like this, I would say that 30-40% is about the technology and the solutions and the automations and those types of things. 60 to 70% of this is all about organizational change management and how do you get people on board for changing how they work on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think one of the most important things you can think about as you do that is, is it's critical to get fingerprints of the individuals and in ownership for their plans so that they're on board for making it successful. And what happens in a lot of large transformations is they start off with the idea that we're going to transform our development process and we're going to do agile, so we're going to form all these small teams out in the organization. And they usually start by selling the idea to the top level executive and getting them on board and committing to a big return and a big investment. And then they have a couple of agile coaches work with a few small teams, and those small teams get to choose how they're going to work and figure out how to make it work. And then once they've got that defined, then they're going to roll this out across the entire organization. And I think that works well for the first few small teams because they get a lot of input into how they're going to work on a day-to-day -day basis, when they hold their stand-ups, how their meetings are going to be held, and how they're going to make that work. But when you get in a large organization and then you go and say, well, this is the way everybody has to do it because we figured out this is how it works, what you've tended to lose is the ownership for those individuals for that being their idea. Additionally, what tends to happen is you get the top end signed up and then you get the managers or the, the engineer signed up and you have coaches come work with them. And what's the role of the manager? Their job is to be supportive. The CIO decided we're going to do this and stay out of the way. You didn't necessarily promote those managers or your top technical leads to stay out of the way. They've traditionally been part of it. And what happens is you get down the path, if you haven't engaged them and they're not part of the process, you're going to tend to start seeing passive aggressive behavior, you're going to start seeing resistance, and you can see the cultural shift start to get undermined. If instead you're able to engage them and make them part of the process, I think you're going to have a much more successful transformation than a lot of what I'll be talking about there's the roles of leaders and the roles of the management chain in terms of engaging with the organization to help lead the transformation. So you get everybody's fingerprints on it that's successful. And a lot of this is not traditionally what you'd hear referred to as agile, but it really gets down to this core piece of the agile principles and applying those at scale instead of scaling small agile teams in the enterprise. I think most everybody out there understands the waterfall development model and they understand the realities that when you try to lock in all three corners, what you end up either doing is typically slipping schedule or working people to death on a death march to get it done. And Agile is nothing really more than breaking that up into smaller, more frequent releases, working on the highest priority things in, in the priority order and getting them out in front of the customer and getting their feedback. What happens when you roll into the enterprise, though, and you focus on the small Agile teams, if they can't independently develop, qualify, and deploy this code, you don't necessarily get people releasing enterprise-level code on an ongoing basis and getting feedback from the customers. You see independent teams trying to qualify and dedicated environments to make that happen. And I would argue that DevOps as a term came out in the enterprise because Agile 
forgot this basic principle of Agile when it scaled to the enterprise because the small teams weren't coming together to make that happen. And fundamentally, you need that ability to release and get feedback from your customers at an enterprise level to be working. So if you walk away from anything from this presentation, when you're thinking about an enterprise with a tightly coupled architecture, you've got to realize that Scrum does not equal Agile. And if you don't do it well and eventually go to solving the enterprise level problems, you will end up with the classic implementation of water scrum fall. You'll still be committing to features and planning 12 to 18 months in the future. You'll be doing all the scrum principles at the team level of stand-ups and burn down charts and stories and all those sorts of things, but you still can't get it released out to the customer because you've got to put the work across a large number of teams together, get it qualified and released out into the organization. When I think about leading a transformation, you should not transform your development process. You should not take any of this on unless your current development processes are not meeting your business objectives. And I think executives are best positioned to understand where and how your business, your development processes are not meeting the needs of the business. And you need to start with that because there's too much to do with DevOps or Lean or Kanban or Agile or any of those things to do them all at once. And you want to start with the things that are going to have the most business value and work on those and then go on to the next ones and continually improve along that path. And if you just go off to do DevOps or you just go off to do Lean or you just go off to do Agile, you're not going to see the types of business results that are possible. And then over time, as it's not delivering as much value to the organization as it can, you'll start to see the momentum and the transformation die out. The other thing that's important to know is that this is going to be a journey and it's going to be ongoing over a period of time. So you need the business, business objectives to prioritize what to work on, but you also need to be learning and adjusting. And if Agile is about anything, it's about learning based on what's working and adjusting to figure out what to do next. And because this is really coordinating the work across teams, this is really the role of executives to lead this continuous improvement improvement process and it's also the role of the management chain and the technical leadership chain to work with the organization to figure out what's working, what's not working, what needs to be improved next. And then beyond that you need a nice prioritized backbone in terms of making sure you're working on the most important thing first. And then probably what a lot of people came here to hear about is really the whole idea of at an enterprise level how do you release code on a more frequent basis and give feedback from your customers. On the business objectives, at HP, we did not go off to do Agile. We started off by defining our value proposition, which is to say we no longer wanted to be the bottleneck for adding products to our plans, and we wanted to free up capacity for innovation. That drove us to sort of set out an objective for a 10x productivity improvement. And my co-author would say, in terms of number of builds, releases, all those sorts of things, we got 10x improvements. But from a business perspective, I think I can easily argue a two to three X improvement in productivity. And as I work with a lot of large other large organizations, they're more their development processors are more like they were at HP before the transformation than after. So most of the organizations I work with, I feel strongly that there are these types of opportunities for improvements. Our next step was to really understand our costs and cycle time drivers. And what we did after we did that is we looked for anything that was a cost or cycle time driver that wasn't key to our value proposition, we either automated, we eliminated, or we engineered it out of the system. Next, you really need to look at this enterprise level continuous improvement process and how do you drive that. And what we would do is each month as the executive level, we would set objectives for that month that we were thought were strategic and important. And across 800 people, you really can't manage an organization with an aggregate of, you know, stories for 800 people across that. You, if you're going to coordinate and improve the work going across the teams, you need to align a set of strategic things that you're going to try to improve. And part of the reasons you want the executives leading this is because if three-fourths of your organization fundamentally change how you're developing software, but another part of your organization decides to stay more traditional and continues to break the build, you're not going to be successful. So you need to you need to have that leadership defining here's the things that we're going to 
try to make work and try to get going on these types of things and working down that path. The next thing that you do is you take those objectives and they're not going to be everything that everybody's working on the organization, but they're going to be the top high level priorities. And if you're somebody in the organization that needs to work on that, then you know that's your number one priority. If you can help somebody that's working on those number one priorities, you know that's your top priorities. If you can't be working on those or helping on it, then you drop more down in the team level priorities in the backlogs that you're working on. So it's a nice combination of tops down and bottoms up working. The other thing is after you've set these objectives, the leadership of executives and the management chains and the technical leader's role is to really spend time out in the organization understanding why the things that people felt like were important or a priority were not getting done. And it isn't going out to people and saying, why didn't you get this done? But it's more, hey, Alan, I know you were working on this, and we both thought it was important, but it didn't get done. What, what happened? What got in the way? So as executives, you start becoming a role of an investigative reporter, spending time in the organization trying to figure that out and prioritizing those things to get fixed nets. And I'll tell you, the first time as a leader, over 800 people, I started walking in engineers' cubes. They started getting nervous. It's like, what are you doing here? But, you know, when I wasn't beating them up and I was actually starting to fix things, you started to get this level of trust. And it's like, oh, hey, hey, you're here again. Hey, I've got this idea. We might want to consider fixing these things. And what you'll see is the one of the cultural shifts that you need to start happening as part of DevOps is you'll start to hear, you know, with that trust becomes transparency. With transparency comes the ability to start fixing things. And software development is so hard to measure the productivity on that executives can't just set metrics and manage this by metrics like they would other parts of their business. They really need to spend time working with the people out in the organization, getting a qualitative feel for what's getting better and what's not getting better. And it's that constant interaction between the executives that can prioritize stuff to get things fixed across the organization and the ideas flowing from the organization that get you to this nice combination of tops down, bottoms up, transformation of how you're going to make it work. It also gives you really good opportunities for a role for the managers and some flexibility in how things get done to really get them to where they're taking ownership for the success of the transformation, which helps get you over that, cult, that cultural sort of how do I engage and how do I get people to follow this change and change how they work on a day-to-day -day basis. Once you have the continuous improvement in the business objectives, the key thing that Agile teaches of principles at a level is you need to work on the most important stuff first, and then you need to get it out in front of the customers. And the first step is really, how do you think about changing your planning process and getting the prioritized backlog? Software is unlike anything else that executives manage in their business. If you're going to build a new department store, it's going to be similar to one you built before. It may be larger, it may be longer, it may be taller, but you're going to use the same materials, you're going to go through the same process, and you're going to do it over and over again. Software is unlike anything else because every time you're doing it, you're doing it for the first time. It's never been done before, so it's much harder to plan it with a high degree of accuracy. The other interesting thing about software that's very different than anything else your executives manage is if you're developing it correctly, it's relatively inexpensive to change and adjust to the latest understanding in the marketplace. And it's, it's inexpensive and it's flexible and able to adapt. Whereas if you designed a department store wrong, you're going to slip the opening of that store for, for a year or so more and the cost of changing there are going to be huge. Software is not like that, and it doesn't have to be like that. And the third really interesting thing about software that's very different than anything else you do is we are so bad at predicting what our customers will use or the effect that they'll have on the business that literally 50% of everything ever developed is either never used or doesn't meet its business intent. So if you use waterfall planning for software and commit a long ways out in the future, you're really taking your most flexible asset, locking it into a fixed asset to deliver features that won't be used or won't be as business intent. And when you think about it that way, you start to realize that it probably needs to be thought about differently. 
chapter five of my book, I go into a lot of details, and hopefully I've written it in such a way that you can take it to your, your business partners or your CFO and help them think about understanding how to treat software differently and manage that piece. Lastly, the next thing you need to do if you're going to effectively get this is start going after the principles to release code on a more frequent basis. I'm going to pause here for a minute. We're going to do a quick poll to see how often people out there are releasing code on a, on a regular basis. Is it, is it daily? Is it weekly? Is it monthly? Or is it quarterly? So I'm going to pause for just a minute and give people an answer, a chance to, to fill out the poll just so we get a, a, an understanding of how often this is happening out in the organization. Thanks, Gary. And you all should be seeing the uh, polling question up on your screen. And uh, we've got about half of you voted. If we can give it another five, six seconds, or if hopefully you're not thinking too long or it's not too complicated a question. But we'll close off voting in another uh, five, four, three, two, one. Let's close the voting and see what the survey says. Actually, Gary, if we could go back to your thing, and here's our, okay. So, Gary, still quarterly. Yeah, still quarterly for about a third. Some people mm -hmm. are doing it daily, which is certainly um, inspirational for a lot of us. And the, the key question you get into is why people aren't releasing on a more frequent basis and how do you get going on that. And I think that's the whole DevOps principle that we're going after and trying to figure out how to get better, how to get quicker at that and more effective. You know what, Gary, on that note, though, just a, one thing I've observed in, in observing these things is, look, if you used to be releasing software annually, quarterly is a a big improvement, right? You, you've uh, done it by 400%. So quarterly, though we look at it and say, oh, they're still doing it just quarterly. For some people, quarterly is has moved the needle. Yeah, and I, I, and I would say there's no real bad software development process. There's only how you're doing it today and better. And you're not mm -hmm. going to be able to transform instantaneously overnight. So. That's why I really focus on this enterprise continuous improvement process where you get better and better and go after the most difficult things first because, yeah, going from annually to quarterly is, is significantly better and you'll see a lot of advantages from it. Mm -hmm. okay. the, other, the other thing that was interesting, in my last job, I, you know, met Jez. He read my first book. I read his first book. We went back and forth and uh, really spent a lot of time together on it and I decided to join the company that was going off and doing continuous delivery. And I got there and I've been working on it for a while, trying to figure out how to make continuous delivery work in this company. And what I realized when I got into it a little ways is that we were starting to meet some resistance. The organization really wasn't seeing any benefits from what we were doing. And we had to sort of slow down and figure out how this was going to be most effective. And I went off and spent some time with with Jazz and Tim Brown over at ThoughtWorks really brainstorming this. And what I realized is I'd made the mistake that I thought I'd never make before. And that was I'd gone off and was starting to do continuous delivery without the business objectives in place. So I stepped back and we spent some time and I walked away really knowing what I should have known before, which is I never should have started in a transformation to do CD. I really should have started off with my business objectives. And what I realized is we had taken one component and we decided we were going to do scripted environments, scripted deployments, evolutionary database, and everything else for that. And as we did that, it was going to make the business more successful and better. But what happened is that component was so tightly coupled to the rest of the architecture, it couldn't be independently developed, qualified, and deployed. And so while we were doing those things, we were still having to release it the same way we were releasing everything else, so the organization wasn't feeling the benefits. So we stepped back and we were really focused on what were the objectives for the organization. And what we realized is we were really trying to increase the quality and feedback to the developers to try to figure out how to make them a better developer and be more productive. We wanted our testing in an operational environment as close to dev as we possibly could. 
and we wanted to re reduce the time and resources between release branch and production and improve the deployment repeatability and environment stability across the organization. And when we went in it that way, we started fundamentally taking a different approach and we said instead of taking this all the way out to production with one component that can't be independently delivered and deployed, what we wanted to do was focus on the frequency of feedback and so we started standing up as much of the enterprise system as we could and doing some automated testing on that and getting that going. And as you design your DevOps principles, what you're really trying to do from a developer standpoint is you're trying to find this offending code as you quick, as quick as you possibly can and get feedback to people. And if you're releasing quarterly and you have hundreds of developers, you're trying to get through you know, thousands of commit and commits and localize it down to the offending code as quick as you possibly can. And you have a head triage person or a lease team that's kind of going through this group of people and they're trying to figure out who brought in the offending code over a period of time, which when they kind of get down to it, you know, they're finally going to get down to it and say, hey, Alan, remember six weeks ago when you brought in this code? It fundamentally broke all these other things. To which Alan's likely to say, six weeks ago, what? Who, me? Are you sure it was me? I think Jules was in there, and Jules doesn't do that good at coding. He breaks this stuff a lot of times. It was probably him. And effectively, as a leader in the organization, what you're out there doing is beating up an individual for something they don't even remember doing. And if instead you're able to localize that feedback and say, it was one of you three people at 11 o'clock this morning, you're more likely to give that feedback to a developer when they're thinking about it, when they're working on it, and they'll become a better developer. And if you have three people in that build, the other two people are likely to point out and help that individual understand the mistake you made and how you could do it better, which is going to make them a better developer. You can also start to put things in that feedback loop that include your security things, it can include your performance thing, and the operations team can take their requirements and put them as close to the developer as they can because the developers really want to write good code that's going to work in operations, is going to be secure, and is not going to have any performance issues, and if they're given that feedback when they're in there working on it, they're going to do a much better job at it. The second thing that I see culturally is hard to make happen a lot of organization is when you start to describe a continuous integration on trunk on an ongoing basis to a bunch of developers, almost to a person they will argue with you how it's not possible. I had my lead of release and quality testing at HP who really was fighting the idea and didn't think it was possible. And he wanted to talk branching with me on a regular basis to the point where I said, no, we're not going to branch. We don't want to have all the inefficiencies of branching and supporting those different things. And he fundamentally wore out a thesaurus trying to come up with different ways of talking about branching. So well, we'll be off in this different place and we'll have the code and we'll work through that. And then after about two and a half years, three years, we're getting ready to release our first product. And I finally came back and said, okay, Troy, we need to branch. We need to get this out the door and get it stable for you know, a few weeks, maybe a month, and get it out the door. How are we going to do that? And he went on a river trip down the Salmon River, and halfway down there's a fly-in ranch if there's low water called the Fly-in Bee Ranch. And he grabbed a half back from that, and he came back up to me and said, Gary, we don't need no stinking bee ranch. And the reason I like this story is it shows the cultural transformation that needs to happen. He went from being the biggest non-believer to not being able to imagine how he could work in any other different way. And I think executives need to understand their role is trying to help lead that cultural transformation and get people on board and understand how to go from what they didn't think could possibly work to an environment they can't live, imagine living without. Most large enterprises, if you took a unicorn engineer and stuck them right in the middle of your development processes, would freak out when be able to be effective. And the key is taking a large traditional organization and transforming them to a way that they can't imagine it happening any other way. The next thing that's a real struggle for most organizations is test automation. And I think test automation is one of the most valuable things you can be doing 
to completely transform your development processes. I will also say it's one of the things that's most frequently done wrong. And if you end up writing a bunch of test automation and not doing it correctly, you're going to end up with something that is not maintainable and it's not triageable. So I, I like this book by Jeff Morgan and his approach, and he fundamentally kind of puts an object-oriented approach to doing test automation that's not considered in most organizations. And what you really need to start with is think about if you're going to test a website and you're going to want to add a new proprietary credit card and you're going to make sure you check out, if you go to your manual test organizations, they're going to want to start by going to the home page, selecting men, selecting shirts, adding to the bag, going to checkout, and making sure it works. And that's one test. The problem is you're going to have thousands of those tests. Want to make sure they have the right shipping address, the right price, the right tax. And then when you go in, when that home page changes, all of a sudden you have broken all of your automated tests. And because the home page or the application is always changing, if you don't do an object-oriented approach to your test automation, your QA organization is never going to be able to keep the tests up to date. They're never going to be valuable and they're never going to be useful. What Jeff Morgan recommends is for each page on your website, you create a page object. When you hit that page, there's a data magic gem that automatically fills in the data. And then when you write a test, you say, go to checkout and make sure that you the credit card works. All of a sudden, then, if your home page changes, you only have one place to change it, and that's supporting thousands of applications. There's also some information in this chapter about sort of how do you make sure they're triageable. You can go into that in more detail, but fundamentally, you need to think about how do you write good test automation, and this isn't something that you can rely on your QA organization to do because it really is going to require a tight coupling between how you do development and how you do test automation to where you make sure it's maintainable and not breakable. The next thing that you want to make sure that you're doing is with scripted environments, what you're trying to do is use scripts to take all the variances out of your different environments and working through that. And if you have a common script that references the differences between the environments, then you've run this script hundreds of time in devs and when you go to deploy it into production you're going to re reproduce something that you've been doing hundreds of times. If you have different scripts being used in the operations and your development environment you're not going to get that alignment. So you want a common set of tools and a common set of scripts defining whether it's scripted environments, scripted de deployments, your evolutionary database, your test automation, you want to be doing that common way all the way across these different environments. And this is where you take working code, similar to integrating the code from the developers across a large organization, the forcing function that aligns the groups is the working code across them. In this case, you're using working code that is the scripts that define the environments, the deployment processes, and everything about getting into production. And this starts a cultural alignment between ops and dev. If you end up having them work on different environments, different tools, different processes, you're not going to get that cultural alignment that you hear talked about too all too frequently with DevOps. The other thing that's important with continuous delivery is a lot of times you'll go and you'll have hundreds of servers out there in environments, routing devices, and you'll configure your, your servers and your routing devices, you'll deploy your code, and then you'll run some system tests. And all you know at the end of that is that your system tests are failing and you go through a triage process. I'm not sure how many people still do launch calls, but they're a painful process where you're really trying to find what server or routing or code issue is there in the organization that's causing the failure. And if it's only one server, it can be fairly intermittent. So instead of doing it this way, what you're really trying to do by doing frequency of build, you're trying to localize the offending code under development. When you're doing deployment, what you really want to do is you want to try to localize your environment issues by configuring them and then running tests to make sure the environment was correct. And then during the deployment, you want to deploy and then you want to run a test server by server, routing device by routing device to make sure that it's been configured and the deployment was successful. 
And then when you run a test, you can actually find code issues. And so that starts the process of building it up and finding what's going on out there on a regular basis. Um, the next thing that you want to do is if you've got a very large enterprise system, you want to think about how do you build it up and, and make sure that you're localizing that offending code as quick as possible. There's three approaches that you can use. One is frequency of build to narrow the number of people committing the code. The other is kind of breaking this into smaller stable components that get built up in the larger enterprise system. And the third is running a subset of tests. Ideally, for every check-in, you'd build the entire enterprise system and you'd run all the automated tests and you'd localize exactly what that one commit did or didn't do to the system. Pragmatically, that's not realistic. So if you've got a large enterprise system with legacy systems and agile components, you're only going to start by doing unit testing on each one and then build as much of the enterprise system as you can isolated from the rest of the organization with service virtualization or something like that so that you can really drive up the frequency of builds here and then you know once a day put the system together for end-to-end -end testing and really this end-to-end -end testing should just be doing the things to to validate the service layer that the virtualization was correct and represented how the actual code worked and the majority of your tests can be run on this cheaper environment over here which is really just your agile components against the virtualization and a smaller subset of your testing is in the more complex, hard to put together, more expensive, full, large enterprise system, which is usually backwards to how most organizations do that. The other thing that's important if you're going to keep your code base releasable on an ongoing basis is to create a culture of green builds and making sure that works on an ongoing basis. And when you have somebody check something in that fundamentally breaks your enterprise system, you end up with a train wreck on the tracks and you end up with a lot of people standing around watching it, trying to figure out how to get it fixed. In the meantime, everybody else in the organization that wants to commit code and move forward is stuck behind this train wreck. Um, and the approach that we created at HP, there's more detail in the book, is we created a process called auto revert. Now it's, and that was in 2008 before it was named. If you look in the Git, GitHub, it's kind of called gated commits, which is unless you pass this minimal level of stability of testing, your code doesn't make it to trunk. And this enables you to keep red builds or green builds on an ongoing basis and keep that going. And that will help really raise the minimal level of stability that your code is at on a day to day basis. And then over time, you can add more and more tests to that. The other thing that's interesting is you can go down the process of having your test, you know, frequently people start on this journey, their testing process is a, takes a long period of time, but, you know, you can get scripted environments, scripted deployments, and all your test automation run within less than 24 hours, and you still may not be able to release more frequently because culturally you haven't gotten your organization aligned on definition of done. Um, this next graph is a little complicated, but it shows, you know, the columns are the number of stories that are ready for release branch. The gray squares are your test automation pass results. The triangles are the number of defects. At the bottom, you can say the days you have a green build and the days that you don't. And what you're really trying to do is the time between release branch and production, this tries to quantify all the work because what you're trying to do is get all your stories signed off all your tests passing, all your defects out of the system to where it's ready for production. And what Jess doesn't really tell people all the time about continuous deployment is it requires trunk to be a production level of qualities, which is a pretty far stretch for most organizations. The first step in here is really understanding what is the work left in the system between release branch and production. Because even if you can test and qualify and deploy more repeatedly, more efficiently, quicker, if culturally you haven't gotten the organizational line on definition of done, you're going to struggle to work through this and get this done. So I'm getting a little bit of tight on time, so I'm going to skip this last slide. There's more details in the book. But really as leaders, the big role is um, starting to get the culture to shift. And we need the leaders across the organization to lead and, and to engage in leading that transformation process. We need to shift the culture from manual QA to automated testing. We need to get developers to think about job one is checking in trunk and keeping it stable in a production-like environment. 
We need our operations teams and our development teams working on a common objective, and we need to get the entire organization of grand definition done and embrace the software flexibilities and take advantage of that flexibility in your planning processes. So we've got a second poll, which is really for different organizations. When you think about trying to transform your software development process as we walk through this, what do you think your biggest cultural barriers are to adoption in your organization? So we'll take a few minutes and, and get through this poll now. Great, Gary. Thank you very much. And just while we're answering the questions, guys, <clears throat> just a reminder, there is a question section within your GoToWebinar control panel, and we have set aside 10, 15 minutes for questions for Gary. So please feel free to just type your questions in there, and we will get to them at the conclusion of Gary's slides. That being said, we're going to close voting here on this one in about five more seconds. So if you have an answer, please do so. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. Voting closed. Scoreboard says. Oh, Interesting. Getting the leaders engaged. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I think that resonates for me and is a big reason why I wrote the book. It's easy for engineers to go to different conferences and to think about how to develop differently and how to go off and do that work. There aren't that many resources for executives. And as an executive led a couple large transformation and spent some time out there, my passion and my energy is all about trying to figure out how to help these executives understand their roles and how to be successful because the business impacts can be huge, but there aren't a lot of there aren't very many places where you can go find an executive who's been there, who's done it, who's willing to help others along that journey. I tried to capture everything I could in my book and it's there that's available and I think successfully with it what I'm hoping is that I've, I put everything in there I wish I knew before I got started and I really think these types of business results are possible for you and your organization and I think it is critical that the executives get engaged in leading it. So one of the things I provided is this book with all the details which can hopefully start you down this path. The other thing that I've really tried to provide is, you know, I know that you with an individual with an idea aren't necessarily going to get it done. I've worked with IT Revolution, who's a publisher of this, and if you either send me an email or connect directly with IT Revolution, if you order in bulk, they're like 12 bucks a piece, and you can, for $300, you can get 25 of them and spread them out on all the right desktops, and hopefully it gets you having the right conversation, having the right people, um, to common language so that the organization can start doing it. If, if that doesn't work, I, I do do presentations like this in organizations, and I do do workshops with executives and CIOs and their staffs and down in the organization to try to get these transformations started. So. You know, these types of results are possible. I think you can go do it. I've got a lot of passion around helping. I think DevOps.com has a lot of resources around helping. Um, what are you going to do, and what kind of help do you need? And that, with that, I think I'm ready to go to the questions. Fantastic. Hey, Gary, that was a, a great presentation. Thank you very much. Before we get to questions, I just wanted to mention we're going to be doing a, one of these uh, buy in bulk deals of the book, and we'll be offering uh, copies of Gary and Tommy's book to probably one out of every ten people who sign up for our newsletter during the month, rest of the month of September. If you live out of the U.S., it will have to be an ebook version. We learned our lesson, Gary, with Gene's book. It's very expensive to ship internationally. Right. Yeah. So we, we could do it that way. Anyway, let's let's get to our questions. And we still have time if you want to pop a question in here, but we're going to go through them. So, Gary, first question is, excuse me, it is project-based. So when is it, whenever it is ready for a push into production, it goes in? I'm not sure if that was a question or a statement. My, my fault. But I, I guess what he's saying, being that it's project-based, whenever it's ready for a push into production, it goes in. 
You know, one of the things I see is projects sometimes when they're having to release with a bunch of other things, the business will want them really badly. And when they do, frequently they get them that way in terms of quality. And so, yes, it can be project-based, but the other side of it is it should also be, you know, that definition of done that we had the slide on earlier. Do you really have code that's ready to go, or are you just going out because it's time to go out? And, you know, are you really, are all the stories done? You can see between release branch on day eight and day nine, we took a project out of here that had a lot of stories that were fairly unstable. And with 10% of the stories coming out, we dropped half the defects. We got our test passing rate up. So I, I think, yes, it can be project-based, but, you know, architecturally, sometimes several projects need to go together. And what happens is when you hold on to a project that's not ready, it can end up delaying the release for everything else that's trying to go out at that time. So that's, right. that's a big cultural shift. Yes, sir. Um, just before we get to the next question, just real quickly, within your go to meeting, uh, go to webinar control panel, under the handout section, Gary's been nice enough to make available a PDF, which I think is the first two chapters of the book, Gary? Or yeah, it's the, first, it's the first two chapters, and it's also the ability to figure out how to order the book if you like it. And, you know, if it's harder for you to get books or get approval to get it around, Maybe you can send out the first two chapters in your organization to the right executives and see if that will help them get engaged and sort of embrace the ideas. And you could just click on that PDF, folks, for the, for the download. Next question, though, is release software. Does it mean release to customer or just for internal stakeholders? I, I think it's whoever is going to be using the software in production. So if you've got release to internal customers that are the only ones that use it, but really you want the end users of what you're creating it for, and you don't want the idea of releasing it into a dedicated environment for the business side to sign off on, because they're just really a proxy for your true customers. Got it. Next question. Our issue with releasing software daily into production is the requirement for security reviews. Oh, this is one of my favorites. Security reviews are a manual process which is difficult to automate. Any recommendations on the tools that help automate, uh, on the tools that help to ensure that new software release does not introduce security vulnerabilities? Well, you know, ideally, what, what happens when you rate before release and you do a bunch of manual testing? is you're really delaying that feedback to the developers and you're trying to find an owner and it's way too late. So as much as possible, whether it's through static code analysis, um, and I'm trying to figure out, Joel has some good things on that, I'm trying to figure out how to get the specific tools. I know Verico does some good stuff in this space that you can really put, not all your full scan, but you know, similar to you can't run all of your functional tests, you get down to a set of build acceptance tests What's your baseline security that you want rapid feedback on a regular basis? And, you know, ideally, you know, I, I say if the QA process is taking more than 24 hours, it's an impediment to your organization learning and going faster. That needs to include your security. So how can you not parallelize that and automate it? Because while you're trying to make security perfect, getting that feedback rapidly to developers is going to do more to improve the quality and security of your code than I think having perfect coverage. Because if you have perfect coverage on something manual and they fix something, you're not going to be able to rerun it on every single code change and hot fix that you're doing right before you go out the door. So really good coverage automated is, is I think, where you need to be headed. So, Gary, security is my bag, and I, I can tell you there are – several uh, automated kind of vulnerability checks and, and uh, tests you could run that shift security left, so to speak, right? Shift it further into the development stack. So by the time you're deploying, the code's been tested, hopefully, several times. But anyway, yeah. our next question, any recommendations for cloud-based deployment? It is a combination of private and hybrid clouds. So this is the one that's interesting is, you know, when you think about a large enterprise system where you're trying to 
people check in and it goes through building up the larger enterprise system or using the cloud to just give an environment for a developer to go validate and learn something about what they've done. If you're doing it the deployment pipeline, you should really have a developer check in. It should automatically set off a set of automated tests. If it passes those, it should go through the next stage of your deployment pipeline and all that should be automated. If you're doing a hybrid solution, if production's in one thing and development's in another, you're going to have a discontinuity down that pipeline where you're going to have something broken. So if you're going to do hybrid as much as possible, I would try to use the same automation scripts like we talked about for deployment, environment definition, all those different things, all the way back to development and all the way out to production. So if you're stuck internal doing production, think about how do you use the cloud with the common automation, so you may not leverage a lot of the cloud automation, you may use your internal hybrid cloud solution, and or you may think about what are applications that can go cloud all the way from dev and into production, and, are there, and then can you use more of your internal cloud for dev to go all the way from dev into production on a, a common platform and approach. Excellent. You're, just trying, you're just trying to avoid that discontinuity. Great. Gary, next question. Uh, which source code repository for continuous integration environment they wrote and developed? I, I guess they want to know, do you have any recommendation around source code repository for CI yeah, environments? You know what, what I really, that, that cultural change where you're having people keep builds green and you want to get to the point where you can auto revert to code or gate the commitments because Culturally, you're either going to be management teams, either going to be cheerleaders convincing them it's a good idea, or your tool can reinforce that behavior. GitHub has that out of the box. So I, I think it's much harder to do with a lot of other source code management tools. I don't know if it can't be done. I just know that it comes out of the box with GitHub. And we, we had to invent it when we first did it, but I think now it's publicly available. All right, next. What was your strategy for bringing together operations and development, assuming that your organization had that wall between dev and ops? Yeah, so there wasn't as much there for HP because operations is just deploying the printer. But in my previous job, um, really the, the leadership of this was I had some operations. I had quality engineering. I had release. There was another leader that had development, and then there was another leader that had the major operations people, and we co-led the transformation. And so we would you know, review what was getting done, where it was getting done, and I think when you get the executives aligned on a direction and approach is, is when you get the organizations aligned, and then when you use common tools across them, I think that's a working code support and function that, that aligns everything. Got it. Um, next, what you know? What are some of the tools for DevOps enablement? Enablement. Um, okay, so we're talking about the thirty percent of tools piece. We're not talking about the cultural improvements. You know, you've got application release automation for your automated deployment tools out there. You have, you know, scripted environments across the different, you know, Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Docker, containers types of things. Um, test automation, um, writing that, and managing that, and then sort of displaying the results because you've got to be able to look into a database across a lot of different test environments and repeated tests and look for flaky tests. So I think those are some of the tools that you know will 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 be necessary to support it. But I think you need to start with the cultural changes and the things that you're trying to solve. And you know what happens is and I think what works for me best is with DevOps, you're really trying to increase the frequency of everything that you've been doing all along. And when you're not doing these changes or builds or deployments very frequently, your organization can brute force its way through problems that you see once a month or once a quarter. When you start increasing the frequency, one, you start seeing the same problems over and over again so you can fix it. And two is you need automation to start cleaning that up and fixing those things so that they're repeatable. And what happens is when you start increasing the frequency and fixing these things, you're removing barriers that your organization's been struggling with for years. 
and that's a key part of making them more effective. So yes, those tools are there, but start where you're seeing the most pain, and if you're going to do multiple deploys a day, you may need to start by automating your deployment, and then you need to start automating some of your testing. Some of your database things and some of your other pieces may change later. And then if you're going to break the problem down into smaller pieces, service virtualization is kind of a key tool to get there. But, but don't go off to do tools. Go off to transform your business and then look at the tools as things to help you solve the problems that you're running into. Is that helpful? You might be on mute, Alan. We run out of time, Alan? I think, uh, Alan, you're on mute. Oh, I'm sorry, I was unmuted. Gary? Yes. I lost myself there. We're at the top of the hour here. We'll try to get to one more on, uh, on here, and then the rest of these we'll have to get to you in writing, and we'll post okay. the answers on the site. Uh, last question was, how do we roll back unwanted changes if we check in trunk daily? Well, the first thing is you should have a minimal level of gating with some build acceptance tests to make sure that it doesn't get in. And the other thing is, I, and I cover this in more, more of my, um, in the book, was one of the fundamentals is you need a build process that doesn't have tight coupling between all the different applications so that you can roll back. So it's, uh, you know, one of the biggest issues is keeping the bad stuff out so that you don't have to roll back. And then the other is sort of decoupling your build process to where you can take a version of a piece back that isn't, isn't built in and tightly coupled with everything else. Got it. This is great. Gary, we're going to have to end it here. We do have the rest of these questions. We will get them to you in writing. And, folks, if you stand by, we will have them on the DevOps.com page for this webinar within 24 to 48 hours. Also, Gary has been kind enough to put up on the screen here his email, his blog, his Twitter. Feel free to reach out to Gary that way as well. Again, the name of the book is Leading the Transformation, Applying Agile and DevOps Principles at Scale. It is available, I believe, on Amazon through IT Revolution Press. And uh, I, you, you just Google it. I'm sure you'll find it. And Gary is uh, you know, on the circuit right now, talking about the book and about DevOps. If you're lucky enough to catch him somewhere, I highly recommend it. Gary Groover, thank you so much for appearing today on uh, DevOps.com. Continue Alan, success. Yeah, Alan, thanks for having me. It's been great to be here. Thanks everybody for attending. If there's things I can do to help you with your transformation, let me know, and best of luck with your journeys. Absolutely. This is Alan Schimmel for DevOps.com. Thank you very much for attending, and we'll see you again soon.